all pay attention to the gearway. Thank you very much for being with us, sir. Thank you, preacher. Folks got to meet my wife in that video. If you look carefully, she had brown hair, blonde hair, and red hair. <laughs> it's taken several different years. My youngest son, my son there is 29 now. He'll be 30 this year. He was 15 when he stopped those two fellows. It's been a while since I saw that. I enjoyed seeing that. I needed to see that. Amen. Pray for my wife. She wants to travel with me, but she has ulcerative colitis. And she said, uh, I said, you can travel with me while you're sick. Make no difference. So she's going to try and travel with me next year. So if you'd remember that in prayer, I would certainly appreciate it. She's a lot of fun to be with. At least I think so. You know. Give me a minute here. Let me just. I'm falling apart. <laughs> Well, praise the Lord. A good time at Riverfest. That's what we do. We're down to Riverfest this week. We gave out uh, about 3,000, 3,300 tracks and saw 46 people, I think, saved. And uh, it was good. Long but good. And it's a lot of fun talking to people in the streets. People need the Lord, you know. And uh, you'd be surprised sometimes we think the least likely people, the ones full of tattoos and piercings and things like that, they're sometimes they're the sweetest people. You know, sometimes they're not. But I mean, sometimes, sometimes they're the sweetest people and they're wide open to the gospel. And so uh, it's just a blessing to be able to serve the Lord. Uh, God wants to save people, and he needs us to uh, get the gospel out. It's a great commission. Anyway, got any questions for me? Good. I'm going to blow my nose. Oh, turn it. <laughs> it's all right. Oh, praise the Lord. Hey, take your Bible and turn to Romans chapter 10. I have four quick points for you tonight. Romans chapter 10. That, that, that's wrong on time there. Yes, that clock doesn't work, does it? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> does it move? No. Oh, you can be here all night. <laughs> <laughs> you know, last, last, last Sunday morning I was here, right? Sunday morning I was here. It's been a busy week. Kind of forget where I was. I think I had heat stroke one day, you know. Anyway, whatever the case is, it's, it's tough to get old. I can't go like I used to go, but uh, that's all right. At least we're going. Romans chapter 10. I'm going to read uh, four verses, then we're going to pray and we'll get in the message. Romans chapter 10, verse 1. The Bible says, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. Excuse me. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. Amen. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. Father, thank you for these uh, folks that came out tonight, Lord. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your presence, Holy Spirit. Thank you that where two or three are gathered together in your name, you meet with us and Father, there's more than two and three here tonight. And so, Holy Spirit, I'm going to ask you to work in my heart, work in the heart of the folks that are here. Thank you for them, Lord. May we leave here rejoicing tonight, for we ask in Christ's name, amen. The Apostle Paul wrote the book of Romans, and in chapter 1, he, 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 uh, chapter, excuse, chapter 10, he says in verse 1, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. Paul had a burden for his countrymen. And he said, he said, my heart's desire and prayer for Israel is that they might be saved. Now, if Paul were an American, which he wasn't, but if he were an American, you know what that Bible would say right there? It would say, brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for America is that they might be saved. We ought to have the same burden for our country as Paul had for his. Amen. We need to have a burden for America, all right? Well, what's going to happen if, if people die without Jesus? They're going to die and burn forever in a lake of fire, forever and ever and ever. No escape. No escape. And people, people walking around all in our community, our brothers, you know, people we know, our family members, people we work with, our neighbors, even the strangers in town, that type of thing, they're going to go one place or another. They're either going to go to heaven or they're going to go to hell. I have a desire to see people saved. Amen. Paul had a desire to have people saved. God has a desire to see people saved. 
I mean, so we ought to get that desire in our hearts to see people saved. That's what Paul said. My heart's desire. Not for me to get fat, live easy, make lots of money, you know. But my heart's desire for America is that they might be saved. Look at verse 2. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. There's a lot of folks around in his day, just like in our days, that people have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. I can name the cults for you. People are out there knocking doors, passing out literature. You know what I mean? They look sharp, dress nice, you know. But it's not according to this knowledge. It's according to what they think in the books that they've written. But it's not according to the Word of God. That's right. Amen. You know, I can tell you about the Jehovah Witnesses and the Mormons and others that go around. And they have a zeal of God, but it's not according to knowledge. Right? Verse 3. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness. They're ignorant of God's righteousness. And going about to establish their own righteousness. Works religion. Works religion. I'm good enough to go to heaven. I don't need a savior. I'm good enough to go to heaven. We fight that in, in America today. Let's have our religions like that. Yeah. I came from a religion like that. I thought good people went to heaven, bad people go to hell. And I said, well, I'm not that bad. I've never murdered anybody, so I guess I'll make it to heaven. But I realized I was a sinner by birth. When I realized that I was, I was hell bound, I said, man, I don't want to go there. I, I trusted Christ. Right? Yeah. I go about to establish wrong. I have not submitted themselves in the righteousness of Christ. Of God, excuse me. Now, is this on? Yes, we'll use it as a demonstration. This microphone represents Warren Garraway, me, prior to my salvation, lost in the darkness of my sin. Okay? Thought I was good enough to get to heaven, but I wasn't. God looked at me, I'm a sinner. He says, Garraway, you're a sinner. Depart from me. Sin doesn't exist in heaven. You've got a major problem. You can't get here because if you got here, pretty soon heaven will no longer be heaven. It's trust in my own righteousness. When I realized that fact, and I got down on my knees, asked Jesus to save me on December 19th, 1977, he covered me in his righteousness. Amen. No longer does God see me. He sees me covered in Christ's righteousness. And therefore, I'm justified to go to heaven through his righteousness, not my righteousness, Amen. but the righteousness of God. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness, they were ignorant of Jesus Christ. That's right. Same problem we have today, people ignorant of Jesus Christ. I talk to people all the time, thousands of people a year I talk to. They're ignorant of what Christ did for them, never heard about it. You know, they say, oh yeah, I, yeah, I, I know about Jesus, but they've never received him. They don't understand that they have to be in his righteousness. They figure, well, if, if I'm good... God will let me in heaven. I'm not that bad of a person. Right? That's, that's what's going to do it. That's not being covered in Christ's righteousness. Right? Got to be born in the family. Amen. They're being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish your own righteousness have not submitted themselves. There's that dirty S word in Christianity. Submit. You know what I mean? Yeah. Oh my God, I'll do it. I'll submit. I'll submit. I'll do it your way. You know, that's, that's, that's called surrender. I mean, that's what uh, we all have a problem with being Christians. We want to do our things our own way, and we forget about God doing it his way. God wants me to do this, and I say, no, I want to do my thing. I don't have time to go to church. I don't have time to serve you, Lord. I don't have time to sing in the choir. I don't have time to teach Sunday school. I don't have time to go out and soul winning. I don't have time for that, Lord. I'm busy. I'm doing my own thing. We're not submitted to the righteousness of God. I mean, it's just, that's the battle of Christian life. We have to give up what we want to do and do what God wants us to do. When you do that, it's called service, but when we do that, God blesses us. Right? Now, let me give it. A, you know, the problem is, I don't have any notes tonight. <laughs> I thought I did. And Richie was kind enough to say to me, you an outline, Brother Gary. I said, ah, I got to take care of it. But <laughs> and there's four points. The first point is this four points in this message. The first point is our desire. Our desire ought to be God's desire. Reaching the lost for Jesus Christ. That's what our desire ought to be. The same as Paul's. Now, I, I got off track what I was going to say. That's all right. You didn't know that. I started some. I forgot it. <laughs> for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone I believe. Jesus is my righteousness. I'm plugged into what Jesus did. He covers me in his righteousness. Even though I'm still a sinner, God doesn't see me as a sinner. I'm justified to go to heaven through the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. I'm happy about that. Jump around if I feel like jumping around. Amen? Makes me excited. People don't know that message. They've heard it. They don't. 
they don't, they don't get it. They go to, go to Sunday school. When I went to church as a kid, they baptized me, right? Trying to teach me to live right without being saved. I mean, without having the presence of the Holy Spirit, they're trying to teach me to do all these things that the Holy Spirit can help me with. You know, it's, it's, it's works religion. How many know, how many have been saved later in life? How many know what I'm talking about? Well, you could say amen. Made me feel better. Amen, Brother Gary. Oh, yeah, amen. Our first point is this. We need to be, our desire ought to be the same as the Apostle Paul's desire. And his desire is to have a burden for his countrymen. We ought to have a burden for our countrymen. Now, a lot of times we don't. I'm glad I saw that video. I started weeping. I said, man, it's a long time since I've seen that. You know? I show the newer one. I haven't seen that one. I don't show the one before that either with, with some other stuff on it. But it, it reminds me. It reminds me what God wants to do, you know, with some people I've forgotten about along the way. I enjoyed that. Thank you, Richie, for letting me show that. <laughs> I can't have the rest of you liked it. I enjoyed it. Amen. <laughs> you see those, the two boys there, and my son was 15, and he stopped those two fellows. He only interviewed one. My buddy Tony interviewed one. He said, he said uh, had anybody ever stopped you before and given you a gospel track? That's pre-Katrina, by the way. I don't know if those boys are alive today. That was pre-Katrina. They filmed in New Orleans. And he says, I've been 16 years old. No, I'm sure glad he stopped me. My son led him to Christ. See? He says, I'm sure glad he stopped me. Man, that's good stuff. Amen. You know? That's, you know, he says, come stop a complete stranger and lead him to Christ? Yeah. You know? Amen. I mean, God, God, God does all that stuff, folks. God, I talked to 45 people this week, complete strangers, and 45 people, I talked more, I talked more, I talked to more than 45 people this, 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 this last week, but 45 of them trusted Christ. Amen. Right. Why? Because I'm a great spokesman? No, I don't think so. You hear that I'm stumbling on my own words right now. It's because the Holy Spirit of God wants to accomplish His will right. and needs people to go do it, you know? Amen. I've heard some terrible presentations of the gospel, Brother Dotson, and people get saved. I've heard some great presentations of the gospel, and people don't get saved. What's the difference? Holy Spirit of God is drawing them. Amen. Holy Spirit of God is drawing them. Amen. A story of the story of the story of people got saved, and uh, you can't, you can't explain it. You just you just you just go along for the ride. You know. I hate to say it like that, but that's basically what it is. All right, Lord, what do you want me to do today? All right, go this way. I go this way. I knocked on a door years ago in St. Louis, and I'm not telling you these stories because I did. I'm telling you stories because it's what God did that allows us to do. I knocked on the door in St. Louis one time. I do the St. Patrick's Day pray in St. Louis, but before the days, we got door knocking. Knocked on the fellow's door. His name was uh, William McGee. I got it written down it's in a book that I'm going to publish. Anyway, <laughs> I said to him, I said, hey, my name's Warren. He said, I said, good afternoon, sir. How are you? My name is Warren Garroway. I'm visiting the Lafayette Bible Baptist Church here in St. Louis. I said, you go to church any place? He says, yes, sir. I said, where do you go? He says, I go to the Je Kingdom Hall. So right away, I said, the guy's a Jehovah Witness. I don't want to deal with him because it's going to get ugly, you know? You start talking to those cults people after a while, it gets ugly, you know? And they start fighting with and arguing with it because they, they don't believe the Bible, you know, they believe their own book and that type of stuff. And so I said to him, I said, listen, I said, That's, uh, can I give you two, two, two pieces of paper? One's from the church, you know, if you want to come out and pay us a visit. And one's one I wrote that talks about how you can be sure that when you die, you go to heaven, would you read these for me? He says, yeah, sure, and I close the door. Now, prior to me going out that day, and before I go at any time, I always ask God to lead me to people that need to be saved. I cheat. All right? you call it what you want, I call it cheating. God, would you help me? Would you lead me to somebody I want right now? Lord, would you lead me to somebody on the way home tonight when I drive to Oklahoma City that I can lead to Christ? So guess what? I'm going to have to stop for gas. They're not going to the gas station. Maybe give somebody a track or whatnot. I'm asking God to lead me to somebody. Now, how many believe God's going to do that? Amen. <laughs> yeah, good. You got more faith than I do. <laughs> right now. So, so I'll be looking for somebody tonight. But when I go out soul one, that's what I do. I don't know who it is. I say, show me somebody that needs to be saved, and, and I believe God's going to show them to me and bring them to me because I cheat. So I had done that prior to going out that day in March, whatever it was, 2010 or whatever it was. And so I close the door, I left. So I leave, I go to the next door. My partner and I are playing, my partner and I are playing leapfrog. You know, sometimes you go together with twos, 
but sometimes you go to get twos every other door. I chose to go every other door because he was driving me crazy. I'm sorry, but he's one of those partners that just wouldn't shut up when it was my turn to talk, you know? I mean, he's a silent partner and a verbal partner. When a verbal partner talks, a silent partner zips it. He didn't want to zip it. He's been obnoxious. I said, listen, I'll tell you what we'll do. You take that, I'll take this, and we'll just play. He said, okay. He said, good. So I got rid of him, but we were together, all right? So. <laughs> you laughing, huh? You go so when a brother Gary on a sunny day, and it's in the afternoon, I'll take the shady side of the street. Met my other guy, take the hot side of the street. What side of the street you want? I said, you take that one, I'll take this one. They don't know why I say that, but I take the shady side. So you watch out for me when we go so with you. <laughs> hey, listen, folks, you know, I'm not stupid. You know, my mother didn't raise a fool. Yes, she did, but she didn't. Anyway, so I go to the next door, and I knock on a door, and nobody's home. And the Lord is speaking to start a big deal with my heart. He says, go back to that door and talk to that fella. I said, Lord, he's Jehovah's Witness. You heard him. I'm, I'm not going to go back there. It's going to get ugly. So I didn't listen. I went to the next door. Door number two. Knock on the door. Nobody's home. The Lord says, Gary, I want you to go back to that door and knock on that door. Now, how many of you know what I'm talking about? Amen. The Lord tells you something to go do something, and you fight with God about it. Amen. I asked God to leave me to people. I'm starting to fight with God. God, he's Jehovah's Witness. It's going to get ugly. You know, he's not going to get saved. I don't, I'm not going to go back, God. I'm not going to go back. I go to door number three. Nobody home. The Lord says to me, blood on your hands. Oh. You know what blood on your hands means? You're supposed to witness to that person. That person's dead now, burning in hell. I got blood on my hands, folks. I'm not proud of it, but I got blood on my hands. I said, God, you don't play fair. I said, all right, I'm going back. So my partner says, where are you going? I said, I got to go back to this door. God, God wants me to go back to this door. So now, <clears throat> one of the things in soul winning, you're always honest. Honesty is the best policy. Amen. You're always honest. So I go back to that door. The guy says, who's that? I said, the fellow's here 15 minutes ago. He comes in and says, what do you want? And I, I, saw, I, I, didn't have, I didn't have a prepared plan like I always do. You know, I know, know what I'm going to say. So I said, you're not going to believe this. I said, I really believe God wants me to talk to you. You know what the fellow says to me? What's he want to tell me? <laughs> it's like God had prepared us all. And I started laughing to myself. I said, well, man. I said, now, I'm starting to laugh. I'm saying, God, here I am fighting with you. And you had his heart prepared all the while. He wasn't your typical Jehovah Witness. He went twice with his grandmother a couple of years ago. But that's what he said. I go to church. Yeah, that's the only church he mentioned. I believe the Bible. I was able to go through the scriptures with him and lead him to Christ. When I leave, he says to me, takes my hand in both of his hands and says, thank you for coming back. I said, don't thank me. Thank him. <laughs> because, you know, I always say that. But I mean, I, I, up to me, he would, he, he would never got saved. But it was God. Work. So my whole point is this. We don't know. Amen. We don't know. We just go. Just go and, and, and you know, be prepared and, and, and develop a plan or something like this. But our desire ought to be that the clock does work. It is moving. It is moving. Okay. It's still wrong, but it's moving. Our desire ought to be the same as the Apostle Paul's desire was to see people saved. I have a desire for that. That's point number one. Point number two is is our field. Who should we want to see saved? Look at verse 13 of chapter 10. Excuse me, it says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's a promise. Shall be is a promise. Not might be, it could be, but it shall be. The whosoever's of the world are the people that we need to take the gospel to. That includes everybody. Includes your family. Includes the people at work. Includes your neighbors. Includes the guy that cuts you off, too, when you're driving your car. Thank you so much. Can I tell you about Jesus? I ought to try that sometime. You know, I might work. You never know, you know. It also includes people, the murderers, the whoremongers, the sorcerers, the idolaters. Includes that fellow that uh, did that damage down in Orlando. Includes, includes everybody. Includes everybody. Our desire ought to be the whosoever's of the world. Now, if you have a problem with some of the whosoever's, don't let it bother you. Just go anyway. Right. Work on the ones you like. <laughs> After a while, God will break your heart for the ones you don't like. But just go, you know. I can, and, and, you know, 
The whosoevers are the ones sometimes that might, might defile your children. But still, as a soul, hey, none of us are sinless, folks. And we all come short of God's glory, right? We all deserve hell. It's only by the grace of God that we trust Jesus and get saved and get covered in his righteousness, Amen. right? And that, that whosoever can be anybody, right? The problem with that is we get sometimes we get off base and we want to seek revenge instead of trying to restore the person who's had that problem done to them. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. People with parents, I had, to, through, I had to deal with that. I never had any problems like that, but I had to prepare myself in case there was. And I, I got alone with, alone with God and I said, you know, if somebody attacks one of my children, defiles them, I have to restore my child to the right relationship with God. I'll let God deal with the pervert, you know, and that's, that's a tough thing to do. I haven't had to do with it. Now I've got to deal with it with my grandchildren. I'm not saying that my grandchildren have been molested or anything like that, but it could happen. And if that happens, the job isn't to seek revenge. That's God's job. My job is to restore the one to good fellowship with God. And so you have to, uh, like, you got to love the whosoever's with the gospel. You know, and sometimes it's hard to deal with the ones we don't really want to see saved. You ought to go to hell, you reprobate, no good, bum, get out of my way, you know. And so, you, know, <laughs> you ever said that, Brother Gary? Yeah, I've said it. So have you, but God loves them too. But my point is to start with your family, start with your friends, your co-workers, people around you, your neighbors, and you, the strangers, you walk down the street, you take a gospel track. I don't even have a gospel track in my pocket. I'm not up here either. So I got candy up here, but that's good enough. You know, <laughs> you start and you pass out a gospel track, a good gospel track that talks about the fact that we're sinners, Amen. that sinners die and go to hell. We've got a major problem. Jesus paid for our sins by what he accomplished on the cross of Calvary. And if you're included in what he accomplished and covered in his blood, covered by his righteousness, we have eternal life. We go to heaven through his righteousness, not our own righteousness, get rid of the works religion. And so a good gospel track will soften people's hearts. People get saved through reading gospel tracks, you know. It, it will soften their hearts. That's our desire. That's what we ought to be doing. We ought to have a burden for the whosoever's of this world. That's how a field is, all right? Yes, the third thing is this. We are commissioned. Look at verse 13 through 15. Let me read that. Our desire ought to see people saved. Who should we see saved? Everybody. We'll look at 13 through 15. For whosoever shall... What gives us the right to do what we do as Christians? What gives us the right to witness? That's, that's my next point, is our commission. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Okay. For in order for a person to be saved from the depths of hell, they have to, only one way to have to go through Jesus. They have to call on Jesus, ask him to save them. Come in their heart, save them, take them to heaven when they die. They got to mean it, you know? It's not a simple, hey, God, will you save me? I don't know if that works. You, you got to mean business, you know. I said that to people on the streets. I says, you know, would you like to pray and do that? They said, yeah. I said, well, you know, it's not a, not a hey, God, will you save me? I don't know if it works. You got to mean business. You have to see yourself as a hell-bound sinner and realize there's nothing you can do to save yourself. And they say, yeah. I said, okay, then you can pray and get saved. Just make it simple for them. Yeah. Anyway, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's a promise of God. Call on Jesus, he'll save you. How, then, look at verse 2, couple, verse 14, a couple questions here. How then shall they call on him and whom they have not believed? That's a good question. Nobody in the world is going to ask Jesus to save them from going to the depths of hell if they don't believe he can save them. How shall they call on him? How shall they call on him and whom they have not believed? Okay, I get it. So in order for a person to be saved from the depths of hell, they've got to call on Jesus. Before they call on Jesus, they've got to believe that he can save them from the depths of hell. Amen. Look at the next question. And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? Oh, I got it. So a person has to hear the fact that Jesus can save them. Then they have to believe that message. Then they'll call on Jesus, ask them to save them, so they don't have to spend eternity in the lake of fire. Right? Look at the next question. How shall they hear it without a preacher? Oh, I understand. Somebody has to go and tell them. Right? Somebody has to bear the good news of Jesus Christ to somebody so they can hear the gospel, so they can choose to believe the gospel, so they can choose to call on the Lord Jesus and ask him to save him, so they can go to heaven when they die. There's a progression there. Listen to me. Every one of us is a preacher of the gospel. Every Christian is a preacher of the gospel. 
Ladies, you can preach all you want to at Walmart. You go to the stores, you can preach all day long. Now, you can't be a pastor. There's some requirements on different positions, but you can preach. You can, you can tell your testimony all day long, no matter where you are. In fact, if I, if I had 12 grannies, you know, if I had 12 grannies that wanted to serve Jesus, if I had an army of grannies, if I had 12 grannies dressed up, long dresses, hats, umbrellas, they could close down every immoral bar in this town by standing outside of it saying, go home, you filthy pig, I'm going to tell your mother. And you, if your old ladies could have a ministry closed down, but you'd get in the papers, you'd be famous. You could close down every girly bar in this nation. If you had an army of, an army of grannies, you had, a, you had 200 grannies march on, on, on something like that. They're meeting tonight in Derby to protest the transvestite ba bathroom. I was invited to go down there at 7 o'clock. I said, I ain't going to make it, but I'd love to join you. Right? Hey, we got to stand up and do something about that sort of stuff. Man, that's craziness. Anyway, let me go back to my point. How should they heal that? You ladies can preach all day long. How many ladies want to preach to somebody besides your husband? Come on, ladies. Get with it. You ought not do that, honey. We'll tell them. You know, go down the store and tell Your presence as a woman, a godly woman, speaks loud. You know, you go into a store and you're dressed nice and you're sweet and you hand out gospel tracts. That speaks volumes. That speaks volumes. You can preach all day long. Look at verse 15. And how shall they preach except they be sent? Oh, I get it. We are sent by an almighty God to go into all the world and tell them about Jesus. Why? So they can hear about Jesus. Why? So they can choose to believe the message about Jesus. Why? So they'll call on them so they don't have to die and go to hell. And it's simple. Go frontwards, for whosoever shall call by the name of the Lord shall be saved. You can go that way, or you can start from the preacher and go back. Whatever, whatever way. That's, we're commissioned by an almighty God to go do that. So, let's go do that. I'm an evangelist, right? Brother Garraway, who do you evangelize? I evangelize the lost. I don't go into churches, preach big meetings, and revival meetings. I'd rather go on the streets and try and win people to Jesus. It's a different type of evangelism. I believe we need both of them, right? But I'm not one of those guys that preach big meetings and bring them all in and have big meetings, praise God, you know, thousands, thousands of dollars spent and everything. Let's, let's go out and win people to Jesus. I mean, that, that's the guy I am. There's not too, not too many folks like that around. I know a couple of them because it's the kind of crowd I hang with. And uh, uh, to me, that's, that's what we need to be done. How then shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. See these shoes right here? We shine to them, Richie, you know what I mean? They're dirty now. But I have a fella, there's a fella in Atlanta, Georgia, that buys me my shoes. He's down to put shoes on the feet of the soul one. So I don't buy my shoes, I have somebody buy my shoes. These are $170. It's gonna cost you some money, because I ain't buying any shoes. I whatever it costs. Got them on sale for 135. I've had them for like eight years, I just had them resold. But somebody actually takes that seriously, how beautiful the feet of them that preach the gospel. He says, I want to put shoes on your feet because you preach the gospel. I said, okay. If I say no, right, I'm going to steal a blessing from him. Here's how it works. God looks down and, oh, I'm glad that clock isn't working. God looks down from heaven. He sees old Don Baker. He said, Don Baker, you buying that idiot Garraway's shoes? Because he goes out and wins people and you're paying. I'm going to bless you for doing that. Amen. Right. Preachers talk about tithing and giving. Why? Because he wants God to bless you guys. Every time we do what God wants us to do, we're filled with joy. Amen. Let me give you an example. The day you got saved, were you filled with joy? Amen. The day you got baptized, were you filled with joy? The day you surrendered to do something for God, were you filled with joy? Amen. The time you lead someone to Jesus Christ, were you filled with joy? Every time we obey God, we're filled with the joy that the world can't give us. You know? Praise the Lord. Amen. I like being full of joy. Amen. Our desire ought to see people saved. We, have, we ought to have a desire for our people. 
for, the, for, the, for our country. Now, I have a desire for other countries too, but I, strictly to America. Told my wife, if uh, <clears throat> the next election goes bad, I may leave and move down to the middle of Mexico and uh, may start evangelizing Mexico. You know, get out of America, because America's going downhill fast. But I don't, you, I, I'm an old guy. I'm 70 years old. I've seen a lot of changes in my time. I can imagine my, my father, my grandfather, turning their graves, probably what they see going on. It's crazy. Anyway, but I can't do that. No hablo espanol, but I can learn. Our desire, our field of the whosoever's, our commission is that there's a God in heaven that sent us on Jesus Christ to die on a cross to save sinners of whom I am chief, Paul said. Right? That's, our, that's our commission. Fourthly is our only hope. Look in chapter 11. I say then, verse 1, I say then, hath God cast away his people? Another good question. God forbid. For I also am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin, Paul says. God hath not cast away his people, which he foreknew. What you know, what the scripture saith of Elias, how he made intercession to God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed thy prophets and dig down thine altars. I am left alone, and they seek my life. Now, the story of Elijah is recorded there in Mount Carmel. Paul refers to Elijah there. When I, you know, I would like to have been there in Mount Carmel that day. You know what I mean? And you, we, sometimes we get criticized because we're, uh, oh, confrontational. Uh, we don't want to be too confrontational. Well, Elijah was that day. Yeah. <laughs> hey, man, maybe your God's sleeping. You know, maybe he's sleeping. Maybe make a little more noise. Wake him up. He's on vacation or something. You know, maybe, maybe cut yourselves a little bit. Be a little bit. Maybe he'll see you then. Wake him up. He was ridiculing the prophets of Baal all day long. Nothing happened. I told my pastor one time, I said, the next time I run into a Muslim, that's in New York City, in upstate New York, I said, the next time I run into a Muslim, I'm going to challenge him. I said, you pray to your God, I'll pray to my God. Here's the deal. I'll pray to God that he breaks your, my God breaks your arm. You pray to Allah that he breaks my arm. See which one is true. No, no, no. He said, yeah, we don't do the stuff like that. <laughs> so I haven't, but I, you know. How's it working? Mr. Muslim, you getting your prayers answered? You going on killing people? Anyway, let me let me back up here. So, so what happened that day? Elijah had a great victory. Elijah had a great victory. God came down and he soaked down the, the altar and the sacrifice and everything soaked through the water, and God's fire came down and consumed the altar, and many people were saved, and all the prophets of Baal were slain. All right, then Jezebel puts a hit on. Excuse me, I'm from New York. Jezebel puts a hit on Elijah, and he runs away and flees. I don't understand that, but I do understand that because after some times of a great victory serving the Lord, you might be a little tired, worn out, Satan attacked you, I don't know. But anyway, Elijah was having went and had a pity party. Now, don't be so upset with Elijah for having a pity party. We have them too. I have pity parties all the time. What do you do when you have a pity party? Have a pity party. When it's over, you go back to work. Yeah. Oh, woe is me. Woe is me. Next day, all right, that's, I had nothing. I had nothing. That belly ache. All right, let's go back to work. All right. Having a pity party. So he's having a pretty party to God. And in verse 4, he says, But what saith the answer of God unto him? What did God say to Elijah? He said, I have reserved to myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. He says, Elijah, you're not the only one. There's 7,000 other ones. He says, even so at this present time also there is a remnant according to the election of grace. He says, Elijah, you're not the only one. There's still a remnant left. Folks, let me tell you, there's a remnant left today. Who are the remnant? We be the remnant, brother. We're the remnant. I mean, we born again, born again, uh, a Christian, we born, born again Christians is a phrase I don't like because if you're born again, you aren't Christians. There's no way to be a Christian to be born again. We born again people, we born again sinners, right, are the remnant that God will use to get the gospel out. We're the remnant. There's not too many of us around. 
There's flocks of remnants growing up here and there all over, but not like it once was, I believe. You know, I would love to see a great revival in this country. Amen? Amen. But I don't know if it can happen. Well, that's all in God's plans, you know. But in the meantime, we need to be working and doing the work of the remnant. The remnant's job is what? Hey, listen, don't sit there and be quiet. Go out there and tell people about Jesus, how to be saved. Amen. Our hope is if the remnant get busy realizing that our responsibility as Christians is to take the gospel to the lost and dying world. Amen. You all with me on that? Amen. Can I hear an amen? amen? That's a weak amen. Let me hear an amen. amen. That's better. You kids can do louder than that. Our hope, our desire, number one. Number two is our field of the whosoevers. Our commission is what God has commissioned us and our only hope for America is that we Christians get busy doing what we're supposed to be doing. Right? And that's the Christian life. We have to die to self, put my feelings apart, and take upon us the yoke of Christ and go into the world and preach the gospel of Christ. Right? That's what we need to be doing. So, Christian, let me ask you, how's it going? Are we doing that? Or are we letting it slip away? Would you stand on your feet? Close your eyes. Nobody looking around. I got two questions for us tonight. Our desire, our field, our commission, our only hope. With the heads bowed and eyes closed, let me ask you. First of all, if you're here tonight and you say, Brother Gary, I don't know for sure that if I died right now, this very instant, that I'd be in the hands of Jesus, in the arms of Jesus. I don't know for sure that I'm saved. I think I'm saved. I might be saved, but boy, I do not have 100% assurance that if when I die, I'd go to heaven. I struggle with it. I'm not sure about that. And I want to get that taken care of once and for all. I want to see in the scriptures how I can be 100% sure that when I die, I'll be with Jesus. If you're like that tonight, would you raise your hand? I might pray for you. Anybody at all like that? Folks, we'll never serve the Lord if we don't know for sure we're on our way to heaven. We have to have that assurance. All right, question number two. Question number two is simply this. If you're here tonight and you say, Brother Garraway, something that was preached tonight in that message spoke to my heart. I need to be doing more in this manner of reaching the loss for the Lord Jesus Christ. I can be doing more. Would you pray for me? Anybody like that at all? Would you raise your hand? Hands all over. Yes, my hands raised too. God bless you, folks. Anybody else? Yes, I see the hands. Father, you've seen the raised hands tonight. All over this auditorium, Lord, we need your help. We need to be doing more for you than, than we are. You've done so much for us. You saved us from the burning embers of hell. and Lord, you give us a home in heaven, and, and you give us a commission, a charge to go forth and reach the rest of the world, Lord, and, 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 and we try trying to, but we could be doing more. Father, you spoke to our hearts tonight. And Lord, you spoke to the hearts of the folks that raised their hands tonight. I don't know how you spoke to them, Father, but according to their testimony, by their raised hand, you did. And Lord, I'm praying for them that, would, that you would accomplish in their hearts what it is they need to be accomplished. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. With well, the heads bowed and eyes closed,